You're saying China is a zero threat to America. They're in their last 10 years right now. The la they're in their last 10 years right now. As a unified, industrialized, modern system, yes. Grant Cardone, 65 years old, and he wants to move his family to another country to make a move. Where would he go and what would he do? Oh, for like, for business? Yeah, for I want to go do more business opportunity. Where would I go yeah. and what would I do? The next wave will involve NATO and it will involve us. Oh, wow. Uh, so wow. The, the goal here is to prevent the Russians from ever leaving Ukraine. Because mm -hmm. if they do leave Ukraine and they get to the Polish border and we get a direct fight between NATO and what has proven to be a completely incompetent Russian force, they're going to fling some nukes very, very quickly. A big fan. I just started listening to you recently. So, Peter, uh, author of four books, l l tell me if I'm getting any of this wrong, Geopolitical Strategist, your speaker worldwide. I'm a money guy, so I'm interested in where the puck is going, so I know where to invest my money and where the world goes. Uh, I, find, I find what you're sharing with people extremely important and uh, intellectually uh, very stimulating. L let me start today first. What is a geopolitical political strategist? I help people figure out where the puck's going to be is the short version. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, there, there are a lot of forces going on in the world that are have kind of reached a critical tipping point right now, and it spells a lot of change, systemic, economic, cultural, political, military, and I try to help the audience that I'm speaking to understand what they're going to be wrestling with on whatever the time frame is that they're concerned with. And who do you typically, like, who's your audience typically? About half of my presentations are to business associations of some form and about another third are to specific companies, uh, usually larger firms in either the manufacturing, agriculture, or uh, finance space. And then the rest runs the gamut, government agencies, universities, think tanks. Yeah, and then why would somebody hire you to come talk about these China, Russia, Israel? Like, like what, what is an organization expecting to get from you when you come in and speak? Well, the, the two things that I work with the most, geography and demographics, are things that most Americans, well, most people don't think about. Uh, geography hasn't really mattered since before World War II, and universities only in the last few years started studying it in a political and security context again. So there's just, there's... It's a pretty shallow pool of expertise out there. Uh, and for demographics, very few people have ever thought about demographics if it doesn't involve marketing or maybe government finances. Mm -hmm. The idea that it can affect private enterprise in terms of capital availability and labor is something that is almost non-existent out there. And those are my two things. Uh, in addition, especially on the government side of things, we just got out of 20 years of the war on terror. And for the entire time, the entire intelligence apparatus was dedicated to supporting military operations. So they weren't thinking about, you know, who are we, are we going to be wrestling with in 2045 and what weapon systems do we need for them? Instead, we've been like, okay, on this third floor building in Fallujah, this door at the end of the hall, the blue one, are the hinges on the inside or the outside? Because we need to kick it in or blow it off. And that's what we were doing for 20 years. We got good at it. But 20 years means that not only did we lose everyone who had the ability to think over the horizon, we lost all the people who trained those people. And so we're building it up from scratch. And even if everyone in the room disagrees with everything I have to say, I still am one of the people who think that way. And in trying to rebuild capacity, you start with what you got. How, how does somebody become a geopoliticist? Oh, totally by accident. Uh, I discovered at my old company that I was the only generalist, uh, which meant that I took an opportunity with the clients to, to learn what they knew, as opposed to a chance to show off what I knew about 14th century Islamic scholars. Okay, and the name that I was trying to think of a few minutes ago was Stalin. So, so you, you made a comment about Stalin. Why, why, okay. why is he so important to where we're at right this second? Because he scared the bejesus out of us. Uh, we knew at the end of World War II that there was no chance that we could stand up to the Red Armies because all of our allies were exhausted and we were on the wrong continent. So we needed uh, 
all the folks in Europe to stand between us and Europe to literally serve as cannon fodder in the Cold War. This, and this the is way what, 19, that 1970? 1945. Oh, 1945. Sorry. Okay. I'm 25 years off my history. Okay. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> and uh, the way we did that was globalization. So we would use our Navy, which it was the only one of size to survive the war that could operate globally. And we patrol the global oceans so that anyone could trade with anyone else at any time and re not require naval cover, which mm. is something that had never happened before. For. And that enabled every country that was part of our coalition to operate as if, operate economically as if they had won the war all by themselves. Everyone got access to everything. And it created the world we know and globalization and free trade and technology and manufacturing supply chains and global energy and all the rest. Um, but what people forget is it was always a security play from our point of view. And so from 1992 on, we elected a series of ever more economically nationalist and narcissistic leaders up to and including Joe Biden that have taken us away from that system. And so this you're is saying, the decade where it all dies. Yeah, I was born in 58. So prior to 58, as opposed to now, you're saying America was basically manufacturing its own products and services we weren't dependent upon other countries. I mean, just bring the audience up to date how that sure. world is different than the world we live in today. Yeah, remember in 1945, roughly half of global GDP was the United States mm. because unique among the belligerents or nearly unique among the belligerents, uh, the war wasn't fought on our territory. So the entire industrial base that we built up during the war to fight it could then be retooled for civilian use. And so from roughly 45 to 55, we were the only game in town. Mm. Um, and if you were German or French or Italian or Japanese, and the Americans came to you with this offer, you know, side with us and you can access the world. I mean, the Japanese were really confused because they had fought the war to get that and we didn't let them have it, and then we gave it to them anyway. Uh, but they're like, okay. Uh, and that allowed the United States to share the security environment. Um, the cost to us was enabling what would become long-term economic competitors. And one of the things that people forget about China is when Nixon went to China, the whole idea was to bring the Chinese into the system deliberately in order to counter the Russians. And it worked perhaps a little too well. Meaning what? what? Why do you say it worked too well? Well, China had never been able to hold itself together as a single power throughout its history. Most of the times that you hear about this empire or that empire, they only lasted for a few years, sometimes only a few weeks. Uh, but under globalization, it's now been 50 years. And you give the Chinese all under a single power facing no foreign wars 50 years to work on industrial plant, and we've seen exactly what they can do. And now we're on the other side of it where the Americans have lost interest in maintaining the strategic rubric that allows it to work. And that's just one of many, many, many problems that the Chinese are facing this decade. Yeah, and we're going to talk about China and that, that, that you know, I love your... I'm your, sure we will. <laughs> I, I love your, your, your uh, angle on it, and, and I agree with it. Uh, so we were... You have two terms here, isolation and then a global globalization. Is that is that fair to say? Those are I think that's fair. And so at what point were we isolated individual countries having their own economies? What, what was the year that we flipped over the decade that we flipped over from one to the other? Uh, the end of World War II, 1945, is definitely the turning point. Uh, I think a more technical term to call the age before that rather than isolationism, that may have been our policy, but for the world as a whole, it was the age of empires. You mm. had the German Empire, the Japanese Empire, the British Empire, they all had their own naval forces, they tried to dominate colonies, control their own trade routes, and those systems clashed and generated wars right up into World War II, which tore the entire system down. While that was going on, we were kind of on our own, on our own continent. We had our squabbles with Canada, we had our squabbles with Mexico, uh, and South America was kind of a gray zone where if there were existing colonies of the Europeans there, we tended to let them go, but we'd always be working behind the scenes to break them away. Uh, by the time we get to 1945, the Western Hemisphere is kind of its own thing, uh, independent of what's going on in the Eastern Hemisphere. And then when the war destroyed everything in the Eastern Hemisphere, we created this new strategic paradigm that, from an economic point of view, we call globalization. I, I call it something a lot simpler, just the order, because it was the first global order that the world had ever seen. And, and globalization was good 
Is it? Is it? Well, right? it prevented a nuclear war. So yeah, I'd say you know, mission accomplished. Yeah. So now, is it still good today? I think the best way to answer that is to go back a little bit to George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, 1988 to 1992. He was the president that presided over the final end of the Cold War and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. (laughs) And he tried to get us as a country to have a conversation about what globalization 2.0 would be. The idea is that we have this alliance, the greatest alliance in human history, that just led the world in a bloodless war in the nuclear age. And I don't think today we really appreciate as how just cataclysmic it could have been and how lucky we were that turned out the way it did. And so Bush's idea was, let's take what we have, let's take what worked and recast it and change the circumstances. And so instead of doing this to counter the Soviets, what if we do this to improve the human condition? Mm -hmm. And we make conditions of participation with globalization about free enterprise and human rights and minorities, and we take the world into a fundamentally new age and break the wheel forever. And Americans weren't interested, so we went for Bill Clinton. We went for what? Bill Clinton, uh-huh. uh, who was much more narcissistic, much more economically nationalist, and then Bill turned into W, and W turned into Obama, and Obama turned into Trump, and Trump into Biden, and yet each step we moved further and further away from that aspirational goal. And in doing so, countries that are less than friendly were able to take advantage of the system as it remained, and that gave us internationally wired Russia of today. That gave us the Iran of today. That gave us the China of today. Uh, And needless to say, uh, those are systems that the United States really doesn't see why it should bleed to preserve them. So of those five presidents that you just mentioned, you you said narcissist. Which, Which one was the most narcissistic? Well... You don't become president if you're not super narcissistic. Yeah. Uh, but the debate in my mind would probably be Who would you give the, the, the big award to? Uh, it would probably be either Trump or Obama. Uh-huh. Uh, they, they, from a um, domestic management point of view, had a very similar strategy for everything. Um, Obama didn't like people. He just wanted people to do what he said. Does that sound familiar when you're thinking about Trump? Uh, (laughs) The difference between the two is that Trump would use, um, Trump would talk a lot more. And while Obama refused to have meetings, Trump likes to have lots of meetings where people talk about him in a positive way. uh, But the policies were very similar. And, And if we fast forward to right now, what are your three biggest concerns right now with, uh, particularly America and then the world? Sure. I mean, with the United States, we're not too worried. We're going through a political transition right now where the factions that make up our parties are moving around. And that is always awkward and it was always painful, but it usually doesn't turn into political violence. I'm pretty sure we're going to get through this one, too, but I've got my eye on it. And if I'm going to be worried about something in the United States, that's going to be it. Uh, We've had a common view of what the United States is how it fits into the world for 70 years, and that's changing. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important for us to rectify our political system as soon as possible so we can have real conversations about what we want. Uh, We can't do that while we're all screaming at one another. So that's another two years at least, unfortunately. So that's the only thing I'm really worried about here, and I think it will take care of itself. Uh, The two things internationally that worry me the most is that the most globalized economic sector is agriculture, and the most fragile one is agriculture. So if we have a sharp crack in the globalized system, we're going to lose the ability as a planet to feed 8 billion people, and that means we won't have 8 billion people. Uh, Whether it's fertilizer coming out of China or Russia, or the manufacturing supply chain that does the equipment or the financing that allows uh, farmers to operate, all of it is in danger. And we're going to lose some very big producers with probably the Brazilians at the top of that list. And that's going to kill a billion people if we're lucky. It could get a lot worse. And I don't see a way around that. I just see some ways we might be able to limit the damage and no one's working on them. Uh, And then number three, this might be a good time to go into China. China's breaking. They're in their last 10 years right now. And the they're information. They're in their contr- last 10 years right now. As a unified, industrialized, modern system, mm-hmm. unified country, yes. And the information control has gotten so strict. It's not that they're not sharing information, it's they're not even collecting the data so they know what's going on anymore. So 
China might break, and the first sign we get is that the product doesn't arrive. So mm. we are in a race right now to rebuild that industrial plant somewhere else. And every day that China doesn't die has become a gift because it allows us to use China's industrial plant to build industrial plants somewhere else. It's kind of like the reverse of the last 40 years. And thank God. Uh, <laughs> but I've got a bunch of clients who have some product on order from China that now has a four-year wait list. I'm like, you got to consider that that might not ever arrive. And it's time to plan for some alternatives. And what do we depend on China for well, uh, other, China than, other than everything? <laughs> China is the workshop of the world. So none of the raw materials come from China, but a lot of the materials processing is in China. And most of the assembly of finished goods is in China. And then there's a lot of manufacturing steps in between where the rest of the world is more important than China, but a lot, a lot of the low-end stuff is China. So whenever you see made in China on the back of a product, it probably wasn't actually manufactured there. It was assembled there. And mm. I'm not trying to say that that's not an important step. That's a hugely important step. Obviously, if you brought me all the components to a computer, it's just going to be a bunch of paperweights for, in my hands. Uh, we need that assembly. That's not an unskilled labor issue. And you've got nearly a billion industrial workers doing this. That's why the Chinese are so good at it. Uh, but we now not only need to rebuild that capacity somewhere else, we need to probably do a lot of it with a different model. China has in many ways stalled technological progress in manufacturing because they have two billion eyes and two billion hands to put things together. If you want to do that stuff somewhere else, there aren't enough eyes and hands. We're going to have to find a way to automate it. It's going to be a different technological picture. And we don't know how well that's going to work or not until we try. Uh, and Mexico probably can't help us too much to, because, because, to be perfectly blunt, the Mexicans are too smart and too skilled and are too good at doing better things. You're, you're, we, saying, you're saying the Mexicans are smarter and more skilled than, than the Chinese. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, I would say that the Mex in terms of labor productivity per hour uh -huh. works uh by cost mexican labor costs about one third of chinese labor but produces twice as much wow so why don't we yeah, use they're, they're well, arguably the most value-added economy out there right now so why doesn't i mean i i don't i don't know i don't hear this from mainstream media so why well, why don't we depend more on mexico for services they're our number one trading partner and they will be for the rest of our lives uh -huh. yeah they're they're the mexicans are firing all on our all cylinders the problem is that there's only 130 Mexi million mexicans and there's 1.3 billion chinese uh -huh. uh, and the mexicans can't add again in the next 10 years what they've done in the previous 30. they don't have enough workers population so mexico wise they is, can't yeah mexico is a huge partner valuable partner already a committed partner, not going anywhere, but they can't pick up and do what a billion low-skilled Chinese laborers do. Right, but India, India is bigger population-wise than... In, India is a possibility. The problem there is while India has scale, if you look at it as a whole, it's not one place. It's really like 30 different governments in a patchwork. It's more like the Holy Roman Empire. <laughs> um, so also... That, co that they COVID's need to massively kicking your ass today, huh? Yeah, it sucks. I'm sorry, man. Yeah. Sorry you, ha you have to go through that. So is this the first time? Fourth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, have, I mean, the I COVID have... was fine. It was the cold that came after that's really nailing right. me. Did, did, this um, one start, did this one start with a headache? Oh, yeah. 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 I'm in week three now. Ugh. Yeah. Okay, so um, India. India. The, you got to compare it to China. So China, most of the population, 70%, lives in one valley in the north, uh, the north China, or the one plain, the north China plain. And that, that is China in a classic sense. Uh, the Indian population is a little bit more spread out in different geographies. It's got the Ganges River Basin, but it's a lot more undulating of a landscape. So building infrastructure is a lot more difficult in India than China, even if the governing policies were the same. You also have a lot of areas in India that have acts, active insurrections. You've got different religions. You've got different languages. Um, it's a very messy place if you're trying to put it into any particular box. And industrial policy reflects that. In China, if they decide they're going to build roads and high-speed rail to connect everyone in the North China Plain, you know, you get 900 million people without one project. 
there's no place that's equivalent in India. And that's before you consider that the Indian government has often seen globalization as nothing more than an American security ploy, because it was. Uh, and so they were more pro-Soviet, especially when the Chinese joined the United States in the Cold War. So India was very late to the game of industrialization and globalization. And it's starting with a 50-year deficit. So India can, India will be part of the future in a very big way. But the first thing they have to do is build out their industrial plant for themselves, not mm -hmm. for us. So I think more realistic partners are going to be elsewhere in East Asia. Um, from a security and a technological and a capital point of view, Japan's at the top of the list. Mm. And wherever Japan goes, Taiwan will follow. But if you're looking for the, <coughs> the fingers and eyes issue, you're looking for countries with relatively mean, large what's, populations. What, is, what does fingers and eyes mean? Deep workers. That's the assembly. If, yeah. you're, if, you, if you don't want to change the entire model on mm -hmm. the fly and try to preserve some of that technological suite just in another place so it's a little bit easier to transplant, you're looking for a country of moderate to large size where a lot of the population is in the same zone mm -hmm. so you can get a, real, a lot of bang for your buck for your infrastructure. I mean, if you're going to spend $10 billion on road and rail, you want it to service 50 million people, not 2 million people. Right. And the places that look best for that are the island of Luzon in the Philippines, uh, the why, island why, of why, Java. Why, why is that? Why, why, that's not a po what's the population there? The Philippines has about 100 million people, and I don't have the number committed to my mind, but I think it's about 40, 45 million that are living just on Luzon. Uh -huh. And then in Indonesia, the island of Java, uh, Indonesia is a country with about a quarter of a billion people, and about half of them live on Java. Um, wow. And then Vietnam which has a population, again, about 110 million, and um, Greater Ho Chi Minh City and Greater Hanoi each have more than 40 million people. So those are kind of the three clusters that I think are to do fantastic as China breaks down. And you, you remember the Trans-Pacific Partnership from like a decade ago? That was exactly what that program was about was getting trade access to these countries. Now we found kind of a way to do it a little bit more messily through the back door, especially with Vietnam. So it's working out, but this is something I, this sounds so weird to say, we've actually had a few people in government who have kind of seen bits of this coming and have had some decent ideas for getting it, getting it going. It's just, it's come right up against uh, what is an increasingly uh, nationalist strain in American politics on both sides of the political aisle. How do you learn all this, man? Do you do you travel to all these countries? Like I, I can't. I buy real estate in America, and and I can only focus on seven markets. You've mentioned seven countries in the last seven minutes. <laughs> well, like I said, I'm a generalist, and it's my job to learn the world from every client's point of view. So if I've got a client that comes in that makes, let's just pick something, digital stereos. That's a, I trace the history of where it goes. It started in Japan, it moved into Korea, and then it moved into Southeast Asia as the technological uh, suite change for producing the product. So you look at where these things go to and why, and then you just project forward. Yeah, so, so a, a company that's maybe global would hire you to come in and speak to the staff or the executives or to consult with them about some expansion or some consideration of an expansion. Oftentimes, uh, sometimes it's strategic planning, sometimes it's a due diligence process, and sometimes uh, they've had their ass handed to them by a country and they don't understand why. Mm. Uh, is any of this, uh, are, are, you, are you ever working for the government? I do a little work for the Defense Department. Um, I don't do as much as I was planning on doing a year ago simply because I couldn't get through the contracting process. We're a small shop. There's less than a dozen of us. Uh -huh. And it takes two or three people working full time just to do the paperwork. And I was not interested. Also, um, I'm in the, uh, the, the lucky <laughs> position that we're turning away paid work right now. So we didn't feel the need to bend over backwards uh, in order to get a government contract. Uh, yeah. What we do f for the government, though, <clears throat> is to look at things that are government policy for the current administration and play it forward so the people who are going to be implementing that policy know what they're actually going to be doing, uh, which of course means that the military loves me and the administration far less so. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you, you have my attention stuck on China because I thought China was the great American threat, but you've said China peaked 10 years ago. I, I, I heard you say on a YouTube clip that 
you were speaking to a big audience, that it will not be competitive militarily until 2100. Did, did oh, I misunderstand that? Yeah, I, was, I think it was like 2200. Okay, okay, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So what, what yeah, does that okay, mean? Why, so... Well, I thought that they were the big military threat, dude, that they were spending, you know, they had matched our budget now and blah, blah, blah. Uh, they've matched our procurement budget, not our total budget. Meaning what? What's the difference between procurement and total? Uh, new equipment, new equipment uh, purchases. They're buying lots of new equipment, but they don't have um, the operational force we have, and they certainly don't have the expertise that we have or the reach that we have. So let's start with the military issue, just to put that in context, and then then kind of go to the really big stuff. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry you're suffering, okay. man. I appreciate you. You're uh, a real warrior to even do this today. Nah, it's all right. It's, sometimes I'm on stage like this. I'm like, yeah, drop it in, drops and right. like, well, I'm talking on stage. Okay, uh, first, military. Okay, based on whose numbers you use, uh, the Chinese have somewhere between 380 and 650 ships in their Navy. We have about 270. Mm-hmm. There are two problems with that comparison. Uh, the first one is it ignores size because in Navy issues, size matters. And so we have 12 ships that are 100,000 tons or bigger, the super carriers, and we have another three on the way. The Chinese have none of that class. Well, they've, they've got one that they've built that is going through flight trials. It is intended to be a test bed. Uh, the no one in the Chinese Navy suggests it will ever see combat. And what, what, what a, are super carriers uh, useful for? Super carriers are what you use for projecting long range power. Mm-hmm. So the beauty of a supercarrier is you can basically take an air force that is larger. One, one ship has an air force that's larger than the air forces of all the countries in the world except for the top four. And you can move it wherever you want and choose the time and the place of an air and naval conflict and then sail on. So if you want to knock over a country, a supercarrier is what you want, and we have 12 of them. So we, And how many supercarriers would we have uh, outside of Israel right now? Uh, we have smaller carriers outside of Israel there right now. They're called Marine Expeditionary Units. They're about half the size of a carrier, but they also carry three to five thousand Marines on them. Uh huh. And and that's so a, we're, that's a different sort of awesome military platform. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, we have you, ten of those. I, wow. So I saw you get got, excited got, on that. So yeah, we've got ten. We've got ten of the moderate size carriers, and we've got twelve of the, the super carriers. And I would argue two super carriers that we have are greater, more power protection capability than the entirety of the Chinese Navy. Two, because two, the Chinese Navy, two, just two. Two of our super carriers, yeah, and we have fif- we have fifteen, twelve, and three more in production. Correct. Are more powerful than the entire Chinese. Everything Navy. they've got. Wow. The, the other issue is reach. Uh, uh, all of our na- ships are blue water capable. They can go anywhere on the planet. 90% of China's naval fleet can't go more than 1,000 miles from shore. Wow. And that assumes they're going very slow in a straight lane to save fuel. If you're actually in combat conditions where you have to duck and weave and zigzag, most of them can't even make it 400 miles. Yeah, so let me, let me, uh, let me understand this. 1,000 miles from China, so we're talking about what harbor or port would, it, would, would they be, would they have their... Well, they don't have any supercarriers. Yeah. So how big is their Navy? 300, 300 boats? They, they've, they've, they've got somewhere between 380 and uh, 700 or sorry, 650 ships based on where you draw the line. But most of these ships are like 2,000 ton Corvettes versus a carrier supercarrier that's 100,000 tons. Yeah, none of them can reach blue water. So how far can they exercise from China? Uh, there's this uh, line of islands called the First Island Chain, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, Indonesia. Um, basically, they can't get past that. So the only thing, the only threat there is Taiwan then? Yeah, Taiwan, the, the Chinese Navy was designed to go after Taiwan. And mm-hmm. if they decide to do it, that will be a really interesting fight that the Chinese, just playing the odds, will probably win. Um, no way to know for sure. Uh, but yeah, that's it. And why would they want to win Taiwan? Because they can't reach anything else or because of the chips well, produced it's, there? there? There's a cultural thing there, Chinese reunification. Uh, it is the narrowest part of the first island chain. It is closest to the mainland. So if they're going to go anywhere, that's where they're going to go. And if you want to think really long term, the theory would be if they're going to break out of the first island chain, you do it at Taiwan and then you can project past the chain with mm. later generations of ships. I mean, that's that's some really optimistic thinking, but that's how it would start. But you're not concerned about that, I don't think. No, 
Because well, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm not concerned about Taiwan, but the rest of it, no. Yeah. What What would our reaction to that be, and why? Uh, we'd probably have a really interesting conversation in Washington. Um, the amount of time that it would take us to get a fleet from San Diego to Taiwan, even odds is that the conflict would be over by the time we arrived. So we would then be in the position of having to do an amphibious assault to dislodge the Chinese, which is a very different picture from a naval fight to prevent the Chinese. <laughs> um, if I were king for a day in that scenario, I wouldn't even bother with that. Yeah. I'd just put a handful of destroyers in the Indian Ocean Basin and cut the energy cord and basically do a, um, a blockade of China 2,000 miles out where they can't do anything about it. And within six months, uh, the country would collapse because it wouldn't have any food or energy or exports. I mean, it would be, it would be really easy. Ch China wouldn't have any food. Yeah. It gets its food from where? China's the world's largest food importer. They take everything from the open market that they can, but more importantly, they import 80% of the stuff they need to grow their own food. From, so, I mean, you'd be from, looking at civilizational collapse in under a year. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so they don't want that. So you got a billion people starving. I would assume they don't want that. The government in China has gotten a little weird of late. Uh huh. So, so, and they import their food from, wasn't Ukraine a big farming? Uh, Ukraine uh, was a big source in the past. The U.S. is currently a big source. Uh huh. So we export a lot to China. Yeah, a lot of commodities. Yes, uh -huh. so, commodities uh, and technology. Yeah, so if we weren't in, we weren't exporting commodities, we would have a collapse over here as well, though, right? Yeah. No? Um, one of the beautiful things about food is if you don't have it, you die, uh, which means that it's the last market that really crashes if things get strange. Okay, <laughs> I've never heard it put like that. You're you're not concerned about China also because of their their aging population. Talk about what's happening there. Yeah, so two things. Number one, you've all heard about the one-child policy. Very real thing. For 45 years, the Chinese have basically prevented people from having more than two kids at all, and in many cases, just the one. Uh, second, and far more importantly, when a country industrializes, they also urbanize, because all the industrial and manufacturing jobs are in cities. Well, when you're on a farm, kids are free labor. You have a bunch. Mm -hmm. When you're in a city, kids are an expense. You only have one or two. Well, since Nixon went to China... China has been through the most rapid urbanization process in human history. And so they've gone from having on average seven kids to on average less than one in less than 40 years. Well, you play that forward and there aren't enough people under age 50 in China to even theoretically repopulate anymore. This is now by far the fastest aging society in human history. And if the data that they have released of late is correct, they have seen their birth rate drop by more in the last five years, six years, uh, than it, what happened to the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. So wow. that, and that's assuming that the data that they usually lie about to make themselves look better is correct. The reality is probably a lot worse. Uh, and so assuming nothing else goes wrong, we're looking at a national collapse in under a decade because of a lack of people. A national that collapse of China in a decade. Yes. Yeah, that assumes no military conflict that they can't win, no trade dispute that they can't win, nothing that looks like a trade war, no problems with the agricultural system, no financial bubble pops. You know, everything else goes perfectly. We're looking at 10 years. Yeah, so is that explained then why they were building cities, counting that as GDP, and then collapsing those cities and buildings because nobody moved into them? I think somebody found that there was no electrical uh, being being expended after the build out, so therefore no population. Somebody tapped into that three or four or five oh, years ago. It's so much worse than that. Okay, so <laughs> two things. Um, number one, the Chinese have a very different financial system than us. Uh, for us, if you want to start a business, buy a house, buy a car, whatever, you you take out a loan and there's collateral. And if you don't pay down your debts as you go, you lose the collateral. Uh, for us. A finance money is a is an economic good and is treated as such. Uh, in China, the state controls that space. Uh, you've got the big state banks. Uh, the government restricts what the people can put their money into in order to keep it at the services of the government, and they expand their money supply by it depends upon the month, but somewhere between two and six times per month what we do. And you know, when you think about all the financial largesse that we have thrown out there in the last 20 years, and think that the Chinese have done a factor of three to or two to six more than that, 
gives you an idea of just the scale of how broken this is. But if you have a bottomless supply of 0% capital, mm -hmm. you can build a lot. And that is the Chinese industrial boom of the last 40 years. It's basically the Enron model applied to the real world. Now, if you are a citizen in China and you're living in this environment and the government is preventing you from investing in mutual funds or stocks or foreign stuff, you have very limited places where you can go. Real estate is one of the few places you can put your money. So you basically get together with your friends, pool your capital, and you go and you buy a condo. And then a couple of years later, when you all have a little bit more money, you go and you buy another condo. But it's a different group of friends, probably. So it's kind of like ABS in reverse. I think I'm, I think I'm getting your COVID, man. Yeah, sorry. It's nasty. It goes through these wires. Yeah. Uh, and so the real estate industry, specifically the condo construction industry, uh, has become the number one source of savings for mm. the Chinese population because it's one of the few things they're allowed. But then you have to play that against Chinese cultural norms like, you know, feng shui. If someone lives in a condo, it ruins the feng shui for someone else. Right. So most of these condos have never had any occupants. Mm -hmm. It's not because there aren't enough Chinese, although there aren't. It's because it's cultural preferences. So you have this entire asset class that according to the Shanghai Academies of Science is probably so huge now that there are enough spare never lived in condos in the country to house somewhere between an extra 1.5 and 3 billion people. So more spare housing in China than the rest of the planet combined by like a factor of four. Wait, wait, say, say that again. 1.5 to 3 billion unused condos that have never had anyone in them. And that 1. is more spare housing. Wow. In one country than the rest of the planet combined by a factor of four. Uh-huh. So it's probably only worth 10 cents on the dollar. Yeah. And that's assuming it was built right and it wasn't built out of tofu. In the right location. Now. Yeah, exactly. And, and do you believe that we have a housing shortage in America as opposed oh, to? Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh -huh. we, we haven't built sufficient housing since the subprime crash. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, I want to talk about that too. So you're saying China is a zero threat to America. Yeah, the threat is from the collapse. What does it look like when it breaks down? How does that affect us? Uh, this isn't the Soviet Union. There's no globe-spanning empire in the traditional sense, but they are a major economic power. And if they were to vanish tomorrow, the industrial plant, that $35 trillion of sunk cost of industrial plant, that's not going to be working anymore. So it's a race between the United States and the rest of the world and the Chinese about who can build out the parts that we think we're going to need before they go away. But don't we get most of our vaccines and medicines? Aren't they produced there or manufactured there? Or, uh, or, no, or the like vaccines you... are domestic. Anything that's biological or high tech is going to be here or in Europe or Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some exceptions, but very, very few. Uh, the, the, the drug exposure issue is that when you've got a chemical drug, especially if it's been around for decades and it's really, really cheap, like all those $4 prescriptions that excuse me, you can get at Walmart, most of those are Indian China. Uh, now, there was a conversation during COVID that we were going to bring all that back because if we were to build them here instead of a penny a pill, it would cost like 1.2 pennies a pill. Um, but that would have required presidential action from the Trump administration, and he went to play golf, and so it never happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, man. Okay, so I mean, it, you're... one act of Congress or a really aggressive executive action from the president, and that can be fixed in less than six months. And so, should we be doing those things here? I think that would be a really good idea. That person, that 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 specific step. Yeah, that's in, that's low hanging fruit. Yeah, we so, should do that quick. Yeah, so why not? I mean, why aren't we doing it in Mexico? What, you said Mexico is almost as is is they're they're a better labor force. I know you said there's not enough of them, but. Seems like we're worried about them coming up here. I want to talk about migration in a second. I think you're going to tell me it's not the Mexicans coming. Oh, yeah, but it's definitely not the Mexicans, yeah. So, so why are we not leaning on Mexico even more, even though they're our number one trading partner? You can only do so much so fast. So one of the things to remember about the United States is one of the perks of a laissez-faire capitalist system is that government planning kind of sucks. It's designed to. We're, it's designed to let the cap the uh, private market decide what happens. And so the Biden administration is the first administration that we have had since World War II that is trying to build an industrial policy. And while I, as an economist, can look at what they're doing, like, oh, they did that wrong, and they did that wrong, and that was stupid. For a first try, 
it's not bad. And one of the things that we have an advantage of here is Joe Biden. I mean, when you have a president that's 1.4 billion years old, he remembers <laughs> industrial planning from the last time around because he was around for it. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, is he a great president? No, but he's a president with a sense of context that we've not had for a long time. And that's actually coming in kind of useful right now. You like you like him better than Trump. Well, that's a low bar, but yeah. You, wh- who would you vote for tomorrow? If you uh, had between to vote- Biden and Trump? Yeah. Oh, I'd definitely vote for Biden between those two. I mean, really? I'd rather have another choice like I think we all would. But uh, if that's my choice, that's how I would go. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, so, so, okay, China's not a threat. If China's not a threat, why, and then l- let me just tie Russia off with why, why are Putin and China associating right now? Or is that just more propaganda? It, you know, they're associating. It's an alliance of convenience. They, they hate each other more than they hate us. Um, when I say China is not a threat, I don't think it's a long term strategic threat. That doesn't mean there aren't things in the relationship that require an active hand. And there are, doesn't mean that the Chinese can't hurt us. Uh, but they are not going to be around long enough. And I'm far more concerned about the impact of their decline mm. than of their rise. Uh, when, when a country dies, weird things happen, and we should spend at least 2% of our effort in countering China and preparing for what happens the next day. We failed to do that for the Soviet Union, and we are still cleaning up that mess. Uh, Russia's different. Um, China, if they decided to go on a military spree, they can't achieve anything. There's no place that they can go to get access to the resources and the markets that they need. They need global access as guaranteed by the U.S. And a military conflict is just going to hasten their demise. Russia's different. Russia isn't concerned with economic development in the same way. Their people are inured to misery. And the problem in uh, Russia isn't naval access, it's land access. There's a limited number of places where other powers can access the Russian heartlands. And if the Russians can forward position troops in those spots, they can prevent any theoretical invasion from happening. And that's what the Ukraine war is all about, is getting to those spots. The two that are closest are in Romania and Poland. So it's not that Ukraine's the end of the story. It's just the next chapter. This is the ninth post-Soviet war that the Russians have instigated, not the first. And it won't be the last if they win. Uh, And the next wave will involve NATO and it will involve us. Oh, wow. Uh, So the the goal here is to prevent the Russians from ever leaving Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Because if they do leave Ukraine and they get to the Polish border and we get a direct fight between NATO and what has proven to be a completely incompetent Russian force, they're going to fling some nukes very, very quickly. And so... If we are in that situation, we're going to find out two things real quick. Number one, how well does our missile defense work? And number two, are Russian nukes maintained as badly as everything else in the Russian military? I would rather not have that come to Jesus meeting. Um, I would rather have the military conflict never go beyond Ukraine. And that's why supporting Ukraine is so important. And everyone who is in power in the democratic side of things understands that. And everyone who is not part of MAGA in the Republican side of things understands that. The problem is, is that Ukraine and Taiwan and Israel have now all gotten wrapped up in domestic political wrangling in the United States. And it's just unfortunate. But we will get through this. (laughs) I just hope we can do so without having this massive strategic defeat that risks a nuclear exchange. Uh, You know, one miracle at a time. When when do you get... When do you have enough of funding other people's problems? And I think you're going to say, well, well it's our problem, too. But like well, leaving it, leaving aside that it's our problem, too. Uh, I, look at the price tag for Ukraine. I mean, about 70, almost 80 percent of the stuff that we have sent are our decommissioned military assets, things that we consider too low tech to even transfer to our other allies. We were going to just blow them up. Yeah, but 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 it's a fifth of a trillion dollars. So so you're oh, saying it, it wasn't really money, it's, it's just we, equipment? If you look at what we paid for it, yes, it's a fifth of a trillion dollars. Yeah. But it was actually going to cost us money to dispose of it. So the Ukrainians are actually doing us a budgetary solid. Come on, man. That's that's No, seriously. That's they, they were, goddamn, they if were I did that that economics, somebody would say, "Hey, you you just did the the Louisiana trickery rickery." We're, we're, 
I'm the equivalent of giving them an old Commodore 64. Okay, so we're not helping. You're saying 64? we're not we're not actually helping them. We're giving No, them- we're helping them hugely because what the Russians have is worse. Uh-huh. Yeah, when this conflict started, Ukraine functionally didn't have a military at all. So now so they let, have let kind of a, this, what they though, call a petting why, zoo military. Why do we put a value on it at all? Why don't we just say, hey, we didn't really, we just gave them some goods that we needed to get rid of and it's not worth a trillion dollars. Or a, a, a that's, a, tw- that's a question for the folks at the Congressional Budget Office. They put a dollar value on everything. Uh-huh. Now, there is cash. We About 10% of what we're giving is ammo, which we have another use for, obviously. And about 20% of it is development assistance. But the Europeans give a lot more of that than we do. Okay. Now, if also, you- yeah, go this, ahead. Let's say it's all real cash and it really has been a quarter of a trillion dollars. Yeah. Rebuilding Atlanta would cost a lot more than that. Rebuilding what? Atlanta or Chicago or Baltimore. But we're not. We're not rebuilding our cities, man. No, 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 no. You, you're missing the point here. Okay. If I, we get into a direct fight with the Russians in Poland, they will throw city flattening nukes. Uh huh. Are you That's saying. That's what we have to prevent. Are you saying that Russia, you believe in my lifetime and yours, we will see Russian nukes in the air. If the war moves beyond Ukraine, absolutely. Uh-huh. Yeah, we're, we're fighting this war the cheap way right now. So you're, you're okay. So how long does this war go on then? Give me that prediction. Oh, I wish I had an answer for you. And anyone who thinks they can answer that I know, but what, is if just you were going to just, up. if you were going to say a number, what would it be? Well, you see, the, the problem is the Russians have proven so incompetent and the Ukrainians have proven so good over and over and over again that everyone's assessments are wrong. Uh, if I was to guess, we have to do this until such time as the governing system in Moscow cracks. Now, one of the things that Putin did in his rise to power in the 2000s is he systematically removed any potential threat to his person and his clique from the entire system. And all that is left are his old cadres from the Cold War who were part of the intelligence apparatus. That's only about 125 people now. So unlike Iran, where the political elite is 10,000 people, and unlike China, where it's just Xi in a cage, you can imagine a scenario where a bad flu season takes out the Russian government. So basically, we, there's no plan to kill them, because if there was, they'd probably hit that big button. But we're in a situation you know, where all of these guys are over 60. Yeah. And just mortality for the Russian health uh, is pretty high. I, I don't mean to suggest that this is going to be over next week, but we're not talking about decades here. We have to hold the line until the Russian ability to make political decisions falls apart as has happened multiple times in Russian history. Is it, is it real to you that, that Putin would line up tanks for three weeks on the border and not have had some communication with Biden that, hey, I'm about to go in there? It, the understanding that I have is that uh, Putin made the mistaken belief that as the United States pulled out of Afghanistan, that it was going to be incapable of operating anywhere in the world. The reason why I say that was stupid is because you basically took what had been a albatross around the American neck for 20 years and removed it, which meant that the United States all of a sudden was free to operate anywhere in the world. But that's one of the downsides of having such a vertically concentrated government is one person can make a bad decision and it it ripples out. And and based on getting rid of equipment, then you think just leaving leaving eight billion dollars worth of goodies in Afghanistan was a smart thing to do? Oh, anything that I mean, getting this is going to sound awful. Getting out of Afghanistan for only eight billion dollars was a bargain. Uh, we probably should have left Afghanistan 15 years ago. Yeah. And the reason we didn't is no one wanted to be responsible for the political mess that happened the day we left. We always knew it was going to be a mess. And that's why Obama didn't leave. And that's why Trump didn't leave. And Biden decided to I mean, say what you will about the dude. He knows how to pull off a scab. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then so what did we spend in Afghanistan? A couple of trillion dollars? Uh, the entire war on terror, I think it was about two and a half trillion. But yeah, yeah. over half of that would have been off. I guess. Yeah. Now, now to right. you, to you, is that real money or is that just stuff that that was real money? Okay. <laughs> that, now, I mean, that was paying for first world soldiers to do fourth world drudgery work. That was that was a waste. Yeah. What would you have done if you were the king okay, of America? 
And I said, look, man, you cannot spend the two trillion over there. What would you have done with that two trillion for America? Well, in the aftermath of 9-11, we had to do something. We had to go in. We had to get Obama or excuse me, we had yeah. to get Osama bin Laden yeah. and we had to knock over right. the Taliban. You said it. I didn't. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> sorry. Um, those goals were all achieved 15 years ago. Uh huh. So the day that Osama bin Laden was killed, especially since he was killed in Pakistan, um, I would have started a broad scale withdrawal from everything. And we're going to let's say we're going to still oh, what I would have done with the money. You're still going to spend the two trillion. I'm like, bro, we got we got to spend this two trillion. Oh, well, what if would we you have spend, to spend it. <laughs> what would you spend it on in America? Uh, I would have done Obamacare the right way and actually had health care reform as opposed to health care payment. OK, reform. What, what would that have cost? Uh, that would have cost less than two trillion dollars. OK, so you still have let's say you still have a, 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 a trillion and a half left over. Oh, um, broadband access on a national basis. Uh, for everybody. Yeah. The, 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 it's that's the a couple hundred billion. best way to help somebody move into the next economic tier of their life. Uh, okay. the, the, the follow on growth for that's huge. Okay, you still got a billion three, a trillion three left over. Oh, well, this, this is a great day. Just get, get you a new car. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I would build a multimodal transport system from California and Texas down all the way to Mexico City so that it's uh, five Mexicans billion. It's, can... That's $5 billion, $10 billion. <laughs> so, $10 billion, that, that's his chump change. Yeah, that's like candy you, for everyone. You still got a, tr a, a trillion two eighty. Like you, you, got, you got trillions of dollars to get rid of. To get rid of? I, this is a great problem. Um, Look, we got no, four, I mean, we're short four million homes in America. Uh -huh. We have another forty million. Just my little real estate mind. Another forty million unwanted, undesirable. Nobody wants to move into them homes, and we have what seventy five million baby boomers that are going to freaking clock out here in a little bit. First, they're going to retire and want to go on cruises, and the next thing I do, they're, they're going to do is die. And nobody wants their homes. They're eight foot ceilings, popcorn. Uh, old uh, air condition system, mm. shag rugs from, you know, 30 right. years ago. You, Their kids you don't, don't want them. use government to, funding to build homes. You use government funding to shape the regulatory environment and to provide but uh, I got a trillion. I got a, you got a trillion. Like the VA. You got $1.3 trillion. Yeah, I know. What, what I'm saying is if you build some sort of credit system somewhat similar to the VA so that uh, uh, vets can purchase homes in a little bit more easy terms, do something a little bit like that. Yeah. The problem with that is <laughs> it starts to sound a little bit like subprime and Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. And the first time we did that, it didn't turn out very well. Remember, the U.S. Yeah. sucks at industrial planning. Right. So the best way that the federal government can shape that environment, unfortunately, is regulation. And from a government point of view, regulation is free. So what do you do? That's with why the... I like infrastructure, because infrastructure yeah. generates the economic growth that allows the rest of this to happen on its own. Yeah. Talk, talk to me about you, the demographics, the aging population in China. When you say that, I start thinking about America's aging population. What does that affect over the next 25 years as people my age start to retire and then and it's then. very real uh, at their peak there were 75 million baby boomers were still a, a little bit above 70 mm -hmm. and on average half of them have already retired mm. that means that they've liquidated a lot of their more uh, aggressive retirement savings plans and gone into a lot more boring things like cash and t-bills and that singular effect so far has tripled the cost of capital of the united states and when As you say the triple the cost of capital when you when you when you how do you define capital uh all sources of capital access. So that's everything from the bond market and the stock market to T-bills to the mortgage rates. I just on the whole, average the whole thing out, tripling. Tripling the cost of? Borrowing. Borrowing. Raising so, capital. Uh-huh. Yeah, in includes so, bank loans, everything. Okay, so that, that means you're saying higher interest rates forever. Uh, interest rates is one of those vectors and certainly an important one, but it's definitely not the only one. Uh huh. And forever is a very long time. Yeah, but okay, twenty-five years. So uh, I'd say fifteen. Fifty. Yeah, f one five. We we have to wait oh, for another uh -huh. large generation to be in their fifties because that when you're fifty-five to sixty-five, 
Right. That's where most private capital generation happens. And the millennials will be in that period uh, when we hit about 2035 to 2040. Yeah. So, so all we have to do is go? wait until then. Where, where, do, where does the money go? Like the money doesn't disappear when I die. Uh, well, the boomers are going to spend all of it, so it probably... <laughs> you think you think they'll spend it? Okay, number one, we're living longer, so the boomers are going to use more as they move into retirement. Number two, they're drawing down pensions and health care because Obama, uh, Obamacare made health care incredibly expensive. And so we now have our largest generation ever drawing the highest health bills in their life. At the same time, they're no longer paying taxes and they're drawing down their pensions. So the capital suck yeah. into the boomer space is massive and they're no longer contributing because they've liquidated all their aggressive investments. Are you concerned about the, the pensions in America? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm as much concerned as the about banks? pensions in almost everywhere in the world, but yes, in America too. Are you concerned about the, the, the pension funds as much as you are the banks? Much more. I'm not worried about the banks right now. More than, more, you're worried about the big pension funds like CalPERS? I, I'm worried about every single pension fund on, in the country, whether it's state or federal or private. Uh -huh. I am not worried about the banks at the moment. Yeah. Uh, we have some of the lowest delinquency rates that we have ever seen in history. And even the places where we've seen things shoot up disturbingly at rate, we're still not up to the 40 year average. So it's not that there's no risk on the horizon. I'm saying that we have every financial crisis we have ever had has been about asset quality. And at the moment, that's not a problem. Interesting. Uh, so you're more worried about pension funds. Mm -hmm. Na name, give me some names of a big pension fund. Oh, name. sorry. I didn't study for this part of the test. I am unaware of a pension fund anywhere in the country that I think is in good shape. No, but, okay. Okay. None. <laughs> so you were yeah. talking about this, this is what firemen, policemen, teachers depend on. Government workers are definitely the ones that are probably a little bit more concerning because people have overpromised. Okay. And a lot of those pension funds are heavily invested in the commercial real estate sector. And I think office space is going to, of all of the property sectors in the United States, the one that I am worried about is office space. Uh huh. Yeah, there's about a trillion and a half dollars worth of office debt out there. There's another is trillion. That low? I thought it was a lot higher. It, for some it could reason. be two Again, trillion. I didn't study for this part of the test. No, that's fine. It could be two trillion. Okay. There's another. There's another trillion seven coming due in multifamily in the next thirty six months. I'm not so worried about that one. Uh huh. Here, let, let, let me explain why. Okay, so the millennials are finally having kids, and the boomers are moving into retirement spaces. It, for both of those categories, families starting out and people looking to move in together for old folks' homes, multifamily looks more or less okay for me. It's not that there's not stress. There's always going to be some degree of stress, but the demographic factors that are driving how we live seem to support that space. That's not how it works with office space. Uh, the boomers loved their offices. They felt it was a cultural requirement, and they're now retiring, and they were the largest generation ever. The next generation in is Gen X. They are the second smallest generation ever, and they hate the office. And they're now becoming the decision makers, and there's fewer of them. So you have a lower commitment and a lower participation rate, not interested in the asset class at all. The new generation coming in from below, the Zoomers, are the smallest generation we've ever had. They are antisocial. They are the quintessential <laughs> gig worker. They never want to come into a general working environment. So you've got the largest generation ever moving out. The new decision makers don't like the space. And the new workers, there aren't enough of them anyway, and they won't come in anyway. So that tells me that office space overall is overbuilt by at least one third. Uh huh. A third. Yeah. Okay. So when these loans come due, you're just going to have landlords that just hand the keys to the banks. Yeah. And well, if that building can be repurposed, great. If not, uh oh. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of that will just be bought at a much cheaper price, and it still cash flows, and somebody will fill it up will over it? time. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. If you if you don't need if if there aren't enough workers, and if the workers who do exist don't want to come in, do you need all that space? Well, they'll come, in, they'll come in when when you give them a culture and, a, and an environment that they want to. We have, we have a thousand employees. They mm -hmm. want it, People want to come into work here. Less, less than 20 percent of our workforce. Are here they is, mostly millennials? Because the millennials love the, the water cooler. Are they mostly millennials? I don't know what uh, average person here, probably 25, 26 years old. 
What, so what, right, but what I mean, generation they're technically is that? millennials, but they're on, they're on the young side. Yeah, millennials. They want to make money, dude. People office. that work here want to make money. They want to make money. They they they, they want to make money. Most people work because they want to make money. They don't just work cause just cause. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just saying. What I'm most, saying is that the, the new generation coming up from below is much smaller. Yeah. And they don't want to come in at all. Yeah. But you would agree, I think, that mm -hmm. the major institutions, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Apples, all the banks all said, man, remote is the way to go. And we're going to let our people work from home. It was a fucking massive failure. They've all now <laughs> admitted it. It did not work. Productivity went down. They did not build the team, the culture, skill set went down, like every major metric. Right. And if I agree with you on everything, not sure I do, but let's say I do. Yeah. I'm saying the numbers aren't there. The number of worker physical butts to put in seats don't exist to maintain office space in what we've been used to for the last 40 years. Yeah. Remember, you still, you still could not, as smart as you are, you still could not figure out how to get rid of $1.3 trillion. <laughs> So let me ask you, what are the things- I should run for Congress and get some progress, get some, yeah. uh, get some experience what, in that space. What are, what are the things, I'm gonna ask you a number of things you're not worried about, okay? You, okay? you are or you're not worried about. Are you worried about real estate prices in America for the next, over the next 10 years? Uh, in residential, because of the shortage, I'm more concerned about what that means for livability. Um, in commercial, I think but, but we're gonna hang see on a, second. a huge boot. I, I just want to, because you're going to have 75 million baby boomers leave their, they're going to die in their homes and their kids are going to be like, hey, sell it. I don't want it. Yeah, I, I hear you. But the thing is, the, the, the millennials are a large generation who are going to need the space. And so whether that means a tear down and rebuild or uh, yeah. an, an adaptation of what's there, the demand is going to be there. Okay. Okay. Uh, you, 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 obviously, how, uh, you think housing prices go in, going over the next 10 or 15, 20 years? Up or down? Up. Okay. Banking. Are you concerned about banking? We've had three bank failures in my lifetime. We never had three without having 300. Uh, the three that failed last year, you're talking Signature and Silicon yeah. Valley, those uh -huh. guys, very different business model. Uh, these were the Silicon Valley banks. And they didn't work off of loans. They worked off of deposits. Mm -hmm. So when a startup gets money from venture capital, it comes as a big chunk, and they put that chunk in a bank. And what these three banks did is they then invested that chunk into long dated securities. So when anything happened to the yield curve, their entire business model collapsed and all the depositors tried to pull everything out. So what it, we saw was not a banking failure. It was a very specific model yeah. that faced a stress point and that is now gone. But you know, every bank, every, every bank participated in this. No, 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 they didn't. Uh, it was just the folks who were servicing the startups in Silicon Valley. And now that's mostly being handled by, I believe, J.P. Morgan Chase. And so it's a much more traditional model. Uh, I, I'm, I will never tell people to not watch the banks like a hawk because that yeah. is always a stress point. But we've just come out of 25 years of really, really cheap capital. Delinquency rates are low. And I think the bigger threat is that people are kind of stuck in their homes right now because either half of them have paid off and why would you take out an 8% mortgage yeah. or the other half are below a 4% mortgage. So why would you take out yeah. a mortgage? Yeah. So while that's going on, nobody wants to build new housing and we already have record low housing stock. So that clears out a lot of that popcorn ceiling stuff over time yeah. that you were concerned about. And, and you suggested earlier that we have a housing shortage here because of 2008, nine and 10, all housing stopped. Yeah. You, you we, we've on probably that. been building about a third to a half of what we should have been every year for 15 years now. Right. So what do you think happens in this cycle? Because we're getting ready to go through a major correction. Housing will stop. Construction will stop. Construction loans are coming due. You're going to have failed projects all over the place. So what, Until we have a reset of expectations based on capital, which is going to take more than a year, I think you're absolutely right. And then we're going to have such a shortage, we're going to have no choice but to build, but it's going to be at a much higher cost with less labor and less capital, and that means inflation. So is affordable housing an oxymoron, and it's not even possible? And it's just the a, uh, goalposts are definitely moving, yeah. and what we have considered affordable for the last 15 years no longer exists. What, what, do you, uh, what is your prediction? Or, are you worried about the U.S. dollar ceasing to exist? Nah. Why? Well, there's no competitor. That, if you, if, every if time you I want hear to, this, if you want the, if, 
If you, want, if you think the dollar is going to go away, you got to say who's going to replace it. It's not going to be the euro because they confiscate insured bank deposits to pay for their bailouts, so no one uses the euro. It's not going to be the yuan. It's not internationally tradable. Um, so when we, see these, be, when we yeah, see these headlines, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting you, but... That's all right. When we see these that's headlines, when we see these headlines, oh, the seven brick, the bricks are getting together and they're trading now Petro for, or AGS for uh, their rubles and... Like, haven't they attempted that for 30 years now and it's failed I mean, every time? You're looking at some extremely bad reporting in the financial space on this topic uh, because it, like at the BRICS summit that they had in South Africa a couple months back, the opening statements for the Chinese, the Indians, and the South Africans, like, we have no interest in a non-U.S. dollar-denominated system. We have no interest in a BRICS currency. They yeah. said that directly in their opening statements, but that didn't penetrate the financial press in the United States. Where, where uh, was the that? The only country where, of... Hmm? Where was that at? Uh, I think it was in Pretoria. Uh, no, in, Pretoria they said, or Johannesburg. They said, we have no interest in what? A non-US dollar denominated system. Uh -huh. No interest in a BRICS currency at all. The only of the BRICS countries who said they want to use something else are the Russians, and they think everyone should use the ruble. Um, so the US dollar will continue to be the desired denomination it's the only one uh, -huh. uh the, the europeans removed themselves from contention and the next currency down that is internationally traded at scale in a meaningful way is the canadian dollar and, you know no offense to the canadians but there's only 35 million of you and you cannot yeah. be the global currency and that's that's everyone and I most mean, of the them pound just want to be americans to be in consideration until the brits just <laughs> couldn't figure out what brexit meant I don't even know what Canada's doing up there. Do you know what they're even doing up there? I do. It's very Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about what about AI? What's your concern or no concern over AI? I actually feel pretty good about AI. Um, the fact that we're having these conversations about the cultural and the, the economic implications, I think, is great. It's so rare that we have broad scale talk about a technology before it's actually here. That said, I don't think we've got another 10 years. Um, all of the chips that are of AI quality are smaller than three nanometer, and they're all produced in one town in Taiwan. And they have the longest supply chain to produce those chips of any company in the world. There are 9,000 companies involved, and half of them only produce one product for one end user and have no competition. So if we lose anyone out of the globalized system, we can't make those chips any longer. And I'm pretty sure that's how it's going to go down in the next few years. So this is a discussion for the 2030s rather than the 2020s. Without giving uh, your, 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 your boy Joe Biden, uh, your favorite president, uh, credit for low unemployment. <laughs> he's, my, he's my favorite sitting president. That's fair. Okay. Without giving him credit for low unemployment, explain to okay. me low unemployment. Oh, it has nothing to do with Joe Biden. Uh, low yeah. unemployment is because of two things. Number one, uh, the boomers are retiring. They're the largest generation ever. And their replacement generation, Gen Z, is the smallest generation ever. So that's just math. Yeah. Uh, the second piece is uh, the deferred growth <laughs> from COVID and the pending growth from the Chinese breakdown. We've seen industrial construction spending in the United States increase by a factor of 10 in the last three years. Almost two-thirds of that predates anything the Biden administration has done. So this is just corporations realizing that they have weaknesses in their supply chain and reshoring as much as they possibly can as quickly as they possibly can. So all of the trends pre-government decision making were already pushing us towards our record low unemployment. The Biden stimulus is on top of that. Do we do we then just continue with low unemployment for many, many years to come? Well, we, we need to double the size of the industrial plant before the end of the decade. That strikes me as being so labor intensive that we will not have what we would consider to be a traditional recession. Because if you've got high employment and high compensation, those are, you know, those are the two weak points that normally trigger a recession. And they're just not even part of the picture. And if the banking sector is more or less okay, we're looking at a very different correction, if that's the right word, when something goes wrong. It'll probably be rooted in inflation. Because if we have record low unemployment and record low capital costs and record high needs for capital and labor, that's putting stresses on the system in a very different way than anything we've seen in the last century. 
Peter, are you concerned? You're not concerned about China except if it implodes on itself. You're not concerned about Russia unless it goes nuclear. You're not. Con- what about North Korea? Are you worried about North Korea? I don't know. What is um, he? Like, everyone's spies have been killed. No one has a really good picture there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the best guess. I saw him crying is, the other day on Google. <laughs> He's a weirdo. Um, the best guess is that what Kim Jong-un is doing is dis- designed to outmaneuver and ultimately remove his father's generation from existence. It's a generational political fight that every once in a while the rhetoric is something we think that is it about it's that it's about us and it's an internal issue. Uh, and if that assessment is accurate, you should expect all the rhetoric to continue, but no real security crisis to erupt. Are you concerned about education in America? We're, we're short, I think, 300,000 teachers, but you could have yeah. you could have sent some we of the 1.2 find- trillion there, by the way. You know, well, sorry, I didn't study for this test. Um, yes. If you're looking for something that we need to work on, it's healthcare and education. Uh, The problem with education in this current environment is from the point that you realize that you need to make a change. The time that it takes to affect the curriculum is usually about a 10 year window. We need to have everything done within 10 years. Mm -hmm. So that means that the private sector and local governments need to come up with an alternative system that's a lot more nimble than reforming the public education system. The reforms still need to happen, definitely. Uh, But they're not going, that's a long-term issue, and we have some very short and midterm needs. Of all the concerns you have, you have not one time mentioned the debt problem we have in America. Yeah, I'm not really worried about that. Why? Either. Why? Like, well, you're, this, just a, you're just a as, reckless as as, spender. Yeah, no, don't get me wrong. Um, the last five presidents have been horrible on the debt, just trying to one-up one another. But... There's no competition. That means all the advantages you get from being the global currency are going to hold for the Mm -hmm. foreseeable future. Um, Our average historical growth rate has been 3%, which means that you can monetize 3% of GDP a year. That's about $850 billion. And that, from a relative debt load point of view, is free. So the first chunk... I, 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 now that's totally a counting gimmick, but it holds. You do do some funny math right there, my friend. But we're not going to have 3% growth for the next 10 years. We're probably going to be having 5 to 10%. Growth. Oh, you think so? Yeah, well, we've got where, to double where, where the size does that come, of the Where does 5 plan. to 10% growth come from? Manufacturing expansion, primarily. Here in America? Yeah. W- what are we going to manufacture? Everything. We, we Remember, there's $35 trillion of sunk costs of industrial plant in China, and large chunks of that have to go somewhere else if we're still going to have finished goods. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to do most of that here and in Mexico. I, I don't hear anybody proposing that here in America. Well, that's because it's not a plan. Remember, we're not very good at industrial plant. But remember, industrial construction spending is already up by a factor of 10. We're moving in the right direction. Okay, last question. Man, I really appreciate your intelligence your dedication to this subject and sharing so much of your time with me, even when you're sick. Um, if you wanted to get super rich, my, some, my, some of my audience has, has a propensity for wealth creation. Mm-hmm. If you wanted that, where would you be investing and what would you be thinking about doing over the next 10, 15 or 20 years? Sure. The weakest point in the bilateral relationship with Mexico is a lack of bilingual technical command. So Spanish speakers being able to speak American Microsoft workers, or I'm sorry, um, what am I trying to say here? You'd go to Mexico. Well, it's technical language. We need more English speakers who can speak technical Spanish and more Spanish speakers who can speak technical English. Uh Those are the seven figure jobs of the future. And we need as many of them as possible, as quickly as possible, because we need Mexico to take over low end semiconductor manufacturing at scale at the same time that we do integrated circuits up here that are going to be crossing the border as part of finished manufacturing products. So the the hardest part of high tech and semiconductor manufacture is the tolerances and, and the, the quality checks. Uh, and that requires a very specific language skill set. And the more that we can get Mexico to assist with that, the smoother everything else is going to go. If I, if, and I know you didn't study for this part of the test, right? But as you say, but if, 
if Grant Cardone's 65 years old and he wants to move his family to another country to make a move, okay, where would he go and what would he do? Oh, for like for business? Yeah, for, I want to go do more business. I don't want to retire there. I, I'm not worried about the cost of living. I'm worried about it. opportunity. Where would I go and Vietnam. what would I do? Vietnam, and you would help them build out the manufacturing process. Vietnam's probably going to absorb five trillion dollars of industrial plant in the next six years. And and if not Vietnam, where? Uh, I mean, Mexico's a solid choice. Yeah, a little bit more familiar. Peter, thank you so much, man. No problem. Appreciate it. If I can ever do anything for you, please reach out to me, guys. I'm going to give you a link to follow. Uh, you, you're you're pretty active, Peter, on uh, Twitter, right? Uh, not on Twitter, but we've got a newsletter video log that goes out every day. Okay, where can people find that? Zion.com slash newsletter. I'll put the link up for you guys. Thank you, Peter, so much uh, for being with me in the Cardone Show. I appreciate it. Appreciate your intelligence and the time that you spent with me. Hope you guys follow him. Make sure you subscribe to his newsletter. Thank you guys for tuning in today. Peter, thumbs up, man. Get well. Take care. Take care.